Um, all right, well, I guess good morning, good evening. For, for us, it's good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to our session, uh, a center of excellence approach to managing Microsoft Teams across your organization. Um, I am Lauren Strand, joined by my amazing colleague and wife. Megan Strand, hi everyone. Um, and we are both Microsoft 365 consultants and um, running the session with each other and for you today. Clearly we didn't rehearse. We did, we just had <laughs> a lovely uh, Microsoft Teams application hang right before we joined. So, um, so now we've presented together a few times. Um, and so the question is, why are we presenting together today? Um, so one of the things we find is that realistically implementing teams is just the beginning of the journey for a lot of uh, organizations and users. So how do you continually handle decisions, guidance and support across ongoing feature updates and enhancements? We are going to use real recent features um, and updates as examples to help you understand, assess and prepare the organization, including uh, involving key stakeholders, uh, making decisions around Microsoft Teams in the organization. Um, and including the content required to support end users. Now, both Megan and I have presented on adoption and governance a number of times. It's kind of what we do. Um, however, to make this realistic, we feel that using the Center of Excellence model or COE um, is the best to get um, is the best way to get um, the best of both worlds. So, what is the Center of Excellence? Well, when building our model, don't touch my slides, man. Um, so when building our model, um, we reviewed a number of different opinions, models and information to think about how, yes, the centre of excellence is nothing new. It's something that's been used in many ways in different organisations. But how can this relate directly to Microsoft 365 and drive improvement and management of the platform or specifically Microsoft Teams? Um, the Centre of Excellence is essentially a group that provides leadership, best practice, research, support, training and, and different things. And within an organisation, it might also be known as a competency centre or a capability centre. It's not supposed to be better than any other operational department within the business, but instead it focuses on finding best practice and helping disseminate information across the organisation. Now, while pulling together our model, it's not an exhaustive model. We're not going into the low level detail because this is only a half hour session. We're going to take you through a high level model. But at the same time, when we did pull together this information, these are some things that as key components that stood out that are really critical here. And as you can see, some of the core things that I've put up here are, if you, when you're thinking about a center of excellence, some things that are really important are things like for example, diversity, you know, you want someone who's been with the company, say 20 years if possible, but you also want someone who's been there a week or a month because they bring in a really great perspective on what they've seen so far. You want to make sure you have a range of roles and departments, different use cases and stories, successes and failures, people coming together to bring all the range of experience to help understand the organisation, make decisions and pull together and create the best practice. With regards to the core focus, you need a purpose. Why are you having a centre of excellence and what's it going to do? Um, what's really important is to be aligned with the business's strategic obje objectives. So if there are pillars and goals um, and also that business's vision for a modern workplace, where are you trying to take people or even align or build consistency? Um, as well as how is it going to run? And then another, another key thing is role clarity. So you're going to pull people into uh, whether we want to call it a committee, a working group, you know, as we said, capability centre or a centre of excellence. Make sure they know why they're there. Make sure they know what the purpose is, but what's also expected of them. Um, you know, when you get those emails or requests and it's the estimated amount of time you'll spend doing this per month, that sort of thing. What are the meetings? What do we want from them? Um, what are key activities and all that sort of stuff? So just some key components that are really important when building a centre of excellence across your organisation. What about some of the benefits? So remember, it's not so much about setting up a really big committee, but following an approach. It could be two people. It could be a small or medium business where it's the business manager and the IT manager um, getting together to at least discuss between two or a couple of people, or it could be 20 people. There can be many ways you can drive value. It could be that you have only two goals, that if you spread those two goals, two goals broadly enough across, staff will improve and your experience overall across Microsoft Teams or your platform will be really great. 
It could be that you want to have an ongoing dialogue to drive consistency in the use of technology in your business. You can focus on ways of working um, and all different things. It's crucial though that you use a model of a centre of excellence for the ongoing management of knowledge and technology across your organisation. Microsoft 365 and Microsoft Teams are growing and changing all the time. And so a centre of excellence model can help equip you to be aware, to assess things that are changing, understand the updates and everything. At a minimum, have a conversation about things that are coming and who needs to know. The more people you have around the table, the deeper you can discuss and the detail and also spread that message back out across your company. So what we have on this slide is essentially just how it can drive value. And you can see some really key things here around consistency, best practice, you know, information dissemination and all the different ways that it can drive value by just starting and having these conversations. So this is our model. Now, as I touched on before, this is high level. Um, we di didn't want to go into all the low level details of all these, uh, we call them wedges. Um, but what we're presenting today is just, is a high level of a central excellence model that we use. So what are, the, some, what are the, some of the key elements that we have when we look at a centre of excellence model? So for starters, we obviously need the technology and obviously the governance. So the governance includes, includes things like process automation, innovation, um, policy, whereas the tech is more around the licensing and configuration updates and support. Also, we need to consider what's the strategy. So this isn't about deployment because strategy is not exactly something we finish and say we're here now, so that's it. We need to consider what's the strategy ongoing. What, what do we define as a modern workplace? Microsoft has their definition, but what is our modern workplace or future workplace? What are the goals we're trying to achieve other than improve teamwork or efficiency? And what's our roadmap? Because just because we've deployed hypothetically doesn't mean that we're finished. The roadmap continues on. Also, we need to understand analytics. We need to understand metrics. So we need to understand how our people are using this. And what's great about Microsoft 365 as a platform is a lot of people will know that there is a lot of metrics you can access. So you've got access to quantitative data, whether it's through the analytics, the Power BI dashboard, you know, the adoption data. Don't forget about productivity score. You, know, you can look at a lot of detail around how your organisation is performing. And then don't forget about qualitative data, survey. You can survey your staff and it's always really great to compare the quantitative and the qualitative. What does the platform show? You know, when you look under the hood, looking at that data, but then see what people think. You know, do they lack confidence? Um, do they think they're great at the tools when they're not? Next, we have employee experience. So this is things like well, the experience of your people, but also thinking through use cases and personas. What are the ways that they can interact, use and get value out of the technology? And then also success stories. So all about the way, the roles, the use cases, the way they can use it, where there's been success and really great stories. And then really critical, a feedback loop. So actually using the what's happening out on the floor or what's happening across the organisation what are people complaining about? What are they getting value about? And bringing that into your centre of excellence model and discussions to think about how things could be improved. And then finally, most importantly, given I work in organisational change, I've even made that icon a person with a cape because I think so important is my Super. department. <laughs> um, but change management, you know, in itself is so complicated with strategy and campaign, communication and learning. Change management, the strategy there obviously tightly aligns with the organisational or business strategy that Lorraine mentioned. So what are the business goals? How does that become organisational strategy? And then the way that flows down to the other streams across change management is, is where we've put learning and training and communication. And obviously their seat at the table, as an example, is really critical because you can't just do anything with metrics, for example, or some use cases. As you can see here around our model, if you have people representing all these areas across the business, literally or metaphorically having a seat at the table, the conversations you know, are really valuable and can really drive change and your journey across your business um, in the platform. So when we look at setting up a COE, um, it's not necessarily about setting up a gigantic committee. Um, as Megan said about whether it's following two people in a small organisation or whether it's 20 people in 
um, an enterprise. Um, the first thing we need to figure out is, as I said before, like the strategy, the vision, the goals, and obviously the roles. Um, we need to understand who the people are, um, and or I guess the, who the people are, where they come from, and what they're doing um, in you know, at this table. Um, we also need to ensure, as Megan was saying, when um, it comes to recruiting the people, is we need to have that diversity. Um, in fact, Megan actually put out a blog article, uh, I think yesterday, um, about calling out the fact that so many people have um, an unconscious bias or they refer to things like, oh, in my previous organisation, we, we did this with, with teams. You know, now, that doesn't necessarily translate to here. So we need to have that diversity of experience. Just because someone has worked with the technology like myself for 10 years um, doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to be the best person because I have a lot of very conscious biases around how things need to be done. I think also um, going back to also the other comment around um, having a seat at the table, you know, you're recruiting those people. You want to make sure that the people that are going to be in your centre of excellence and whether it's a, a once a month meeting or however big or small you make it, you are recruiting people that can add value can assess information, can know the organisation and, you know, really help with even just disseminating. You know, you might have a comms person there. They might say, I don't know tech and I'm not sure about the business, but that's okay. They know the channels to communicate, to spread information. And on that, that's a really good example because if you think about conversely, that's a communications person who doesn't necessarily know tech, whereas a lot of times we'll deal with tech who don't know how to communicate. And a really good example of this is IT pros who want to turn off Yammer because they don't find much value in it. Whereas that communications person is going to find immense value in Yammer because they can you know, get to the entire organization. Yeah, when you're in project land and you are leading up to a go live, you do often in your requirements gathering or through your project communicate back through the business with what's going on. But the difference here is there isn't an end date. You don't go live and move on. With, this, with a centre of excellence approach, it's essentially your key stakeholders that you needed to engage in your project need to have representation, um, we're suggesting ongoing to help you really manage the platform. And so the final point, originally we had this third phase as get started because it's really just do something. Um, and that's the great thing about this is as we've touched on, it could be a couple of people and it's really just about doing the thing or doing something, you know, Get together once, have a chat and say, there's a new feature coming, what do we do about it? Can we disable it? Do we want it turned on? And that's what we're getting at. But the more you put into this and the more people you have involved, the richer the conversation. So it moves from, oh, quick, there's a feature, send an email to, hey, change management person, let's do an impact assessment of the changes that are coming next month or next quarter with the platform or with teams. Um, and then the business can be involved in, do they want it? Will they use it? Is there risk? And, and all those sorts of things. And there needs to be a regular rhythm and cadence for this to occur. Otherwise, it will very quickly fall apart because if you wait too long to have these meetings, then you've got A, too many features to, to discuss and may not necessarily get to everything, or some features may have actually already rolled out or appeared before you actually get the chance to even discuss them. Um, if you do it too quickly, you know, then potentially you kind of run out of steam, people get frustrated, they'll start cancelling. Um, so it's about finding the right harmony. I personally actually operate a, a number of governance committees for um, different organisations. Some um, I do fortnightly, some I do weekly. It comes down to their approach. And one of them, um, we have a 45 minute standing meeting. Literally this Monday, we did it in 15 minutes. So it's mm. not about we've got this block of time, let's pad it out. It's let's focus on what we need to do. If we don't need to do anything or we can do it through a conversation, um, you, know, you know, Teams channel conversation, then let's move on from there. I think also in a number of those, one of the biggest challenges that we find is getting in people's calendars. If you don't start off strong, if you don't give people awareness of what do I need from you, um, where I've seen the bigger challenges in the Centre of Excellence's type uh, working groups that we've run is getting people to turn up. Once they turn up and see the value, because the discussion is going to be high value and really um, impacts everyone, then you get the rhythm and it takes off. Um, but just as we've sort of said here, as far as tips go for setting one up is, you know, plan it, prep it, make sure you know what you're doing, you know, get a purpose, get a vision and just start to operationalise and get it going. And you can iterate on going and work out what as a group you want to achieve. So Megan and I have faffed on for a bit about COE in theory. Now you're probably saying, how do we actually go to apply it? So how do we you know, take this COE model, this lovely wagon wheel that we've shown you and apply it to a product like Microsoft Teams. Now, 
is Microsoft Teams a product? Is it just an application? Is it a service? Is it a platform? The reality is it's all of these things. But when we look at just the application itself, for example, what is it beyond just a communications, um, you know, when we look beyond the, the aspects of communication, such as chat, uh, conversations in channels, calling and meetings, what is Microsoft Teams? Well, when you fully start to use the features in Microsoft Teams, you are actually making use of a number of apps, such as SharePoint, Forms, Planner, Whiteboard, Power Virtual Agents, Lists, technically SharePoint, uh, OneNote, um, Power Apps, Power Automate, um, Power BI. Now, if we're looking at things like approvals, for example, that's really, you know, just um, Power Automate in a lovely little skin. So when we think about all these, these actually aren't Teams apps. They're apps that are in Teams. These are actually Microsoft 365 apps and services that go far beyond Microsoft Teams. So when we look at a feature in Teams, we need to consider how this relates to the broader Microsoft 365 environment that covers all of the elements of our COA wheel. So now what are we going to do? We are actually going to apply it. So the first one is background effects. So um, we all know what background effects are. And so what we're doing is we've picked two things that we wanted to talk to you in reference to the COE. The reason why we picked background effects is because, yes, it's old. You use it, you know it. But there's some really great points, I think, with background effects to give you more context around the center of excellence model. So background effects came out maybe, I feel like, a year ago, um, somewhere mid-year. Uh, as someone who does organize this training and keeps across this data, it was one of those features where it took off and literally overnight you were dialing into meetings um, and people had it on. Um, and so this image that we've put up was almost designed to transition in uh, in a frustrating way. But basically, I mean, look at this visual. It is, well, don't know about you, but it's pretty chaotic. It's pretty colorful. It's pretty intense. So background effects in, exploded in popularity. It was easy to, to use and people started using it. But for a lot of organizations, it took off really rapidly before they had even thought about it. So firstly, uh, there was a lot of organizations where, I mean, I was talking to vendors and consultants from other organizations looking like this. What about their brand and their image? Um, so it did kind of cause a bit of chaos and, and branding challenges. But also remember a few months later, there was all the research about cognitive load and meeting fatigue. So we all started talking about meeting fatigue. Well, here's one of the elements of meeting fatigue. Look at this image. Think about if we kept this image up for an entire hour, how would your head be? Think about that cognitive load. So um, background effects was a feature that if you knew it was coming, you would have had time to understand. If you think about the center of excellence and all the wedges and the roles and the people around the table, let's have a think about it from that perspective. So if we had had a conversation about it before it happened, firstly, we would have probably had a look about it and thought about how does this look? Are we okay with our staff using this? Are they going to faff about and waste time with it? Because we all know there was a phase where everyone was talking about it a lot. But there is that thing of personal brand or business brand compliance, all sorts of things. It didn't really need training. Um, so, but you can see where now taking it to the model, you know, I've just talked about probably change communication, learning, training, process, consistency, compliance. Um, but what about the tech view? Well, the challenge that we had with background effects was it was unfortunately rolled out without any administrative controls. So we had no ability to uh, restrict the ability for end users to upload their own backgrounds. And what we saw was, you know, Fox, Ikea, Disney, all these different organizations released these background packs for Zoom and Teams. And people were just loading them. And as Megan was saying, we're just, you know, meetings were being consumed at the start with, look at my background, look at my background, look at my background. Um, and so, yeah, we didn't have that control. Now, that control eventually came uh, initially in the form of a PowerShell setting um, and now has actually made its way to a Teams administrative um, center switch that we can apply based on policy. So we don't necessarily have to have a one size fits all. And we've got different levels of controls as well. So it's not just about background effects per se, it's about you know, what we do with the background in general. And now we're seeing coming out to mobile devices as well. Yeah, so I'm sure a lot of you now are either work for organizations or have had meetings with people who have branded backgrounds. With that though, I'm sure many of you know that when you go into background effects later, there were the mock offices, which were mostly white um, and minimalistic. Now remember that was to help with cognitive load. 
Um, and it was created for a reason, as well as giving people privacy and putting an image up instead of their home office or environment. But so our point is that this feature exploded into the into the market in, across end users. Um, and if we did it a bit differently, we would have been able to educate people. We would have been able to think about branding and what was appropriate. And there would have just been guidance and communication, as well as um, a, you know a number of aspects around the employee experience, remote working, meeting fatigue, and the impact it was having. So just taking that simple feature through the center of excellence model would have had a number of boxes ticked, appropriate discussions, and perhaps a different experience. Absolutely, and, and even after the features then got rolled out, so now that we do have the ability to control it through the admin center, uh, we'll soon have the ability to be able to push out custom backgrounds. So your own organizational branded ones or whatever you want. Um, you can technically do this now through things like grid policy, PowerShell, um, Intune, however you want. Um, so it is possible. So then it's not just a case of background effects are here, that's it, the ship has sailed. Now we've got more controls coming out and more ability to push out backgrounds. Um, so we would then reapply that COE model and say, okay, we're making a change to the service. How do we do this? It's not just Lauren flicks a switch in the team's admin center and away we go. It's, well, we need to say, Megan, what, how do we communicate to people that we now have official backgrounds? And what's the impact of any change with people and what they're doing already? And if we take away background effects, custom ones, people might get upset. So how do we handle that as well? I know all of you on the call right now think we're really negative and we're anti Bob's Burgers and the Simpsons. <laughs> They're great, but they do cause fatigue. All right, let's move on to example two. So the bulletins and milestones apps. Um, these are just some of the examples of some apps that were made available by Microsoft um, as kind of like sample apps, but also ones that you could just users could just go and deploy. Um, but the thing is with these apps, they are fantastic, don't get me wrong, but there are multiple aspects to consider. So the first thing when we look at something like bulletins, it's a communications tool, or milestones, which is a project reporting tool. How does this align with other tools that the organization may already have, such as um, you know, project roadmap uh, functionality, or Yammer, or SharePoint News? I do need to jump in, and just to clarify, I personally feel there'll be a lot of people in this call who haven't heard of these. So when, timeline. When did these come in? Uh, these only came in the last few months. Yep. So this is a very, also a very important person, a point because I've seen organizations that, and we'll go through this, that these apps appeared and control was lost because IT didn't know about it, but users found buttons and started pressing things. So we talked about like, how do these apps actually um, fit into it? Uh, we also then have to look at the fact that these are, while they're apps, they're actually power apps apps. Um, so we then have to look at M365 governance in terms of um, who has access to Power Apps uh, and license itself, because to use these apps, you actually need to have a license, not just to create. So if I want to consume it, I want to look at the milestones or I want to look at the bulletins, I too need to actually have a Power Apps license. And some organizations may have said, we're not doing Power Apps yet, so we're turning it off for most people. Um, we then also have to look at the Teams platform governance aspect of this, which is how do we determine what apps are allowed inside of Microsoft Teams? Now, these two apps are not considered third-party apps. So if any organization has taken a reasonable approach of saying, we don't allow third-party apps to appear in the store automatically, these aren't third-party apps, they're first-party apps, so they will just appear there. Um, so that won't really stop them from being installed. Then there's the power platform governance aspect of this. I love governance. Um, so how do, you know, when you add these apps to a team, they actually create a dataverse environment, uh, which if you're not familiar is effectively a power platform environment where apps and data and, and other things can go into it. So even if in power platform, you've disabled the ability for end users to create um, power platform environments and restricted it to just admins, these apps don't care they will still create the Dataverse for Teams environment for you, and that can then be upgraded, more stuff can go into it as well. Then think about the actual governance of the team itself. So who has the ability to add apps and tabs into a team? A lot of times it's left to the default, which is everybody can do it, so therefore these apps just start appearing. So is that the case or should it be the owners? Then we've got the challenge around support. So who's responsible for supporting this app? if something were to go wrong, because the configuration of the app itself is specific to the team, not to teams, to the team. Um, and because it uses Teams, Power Apps, and Dataverse for Teams, 
that covers multiple areas of expertise. So a lot of times Teams is owned by the communications team because you know it's Skype with upgraded skin. Um, they're not going to understand Dataverse and Power Platform and those kind of things. Um, possibly they don't, those teams don't even talk to each other, and this is the challenge that we've got. And also adoption, Megan. Hey, here's an app. Everybody start using it. It's really um, interesting, this one, because I, I, I don't believe, you know, there's many of you will have heard of these or let alone touch them. None of the organisations that we're probably, either of us are engaging with are using these. Um, IT support desk, it's funny, I wrote a blog, actually published a blog today about how IT support are not across a lot of the apps in the platform, certainly not these. So what we're touching on here is, you know, without any discussion, things that become available, people can use if they stuff it up or if they get confused or they, whatever they do, there's no support, um, there's no governance. And um, from an adoption perspective, what stops them from being another app that, you know, it just gets put out there, no proper training, never gets fully adopted, later gets abandoned. So the point here is, I guess, that these things need to be considered. They need to be reviewed, whether it's a tiny feature like background effects or whether it's an app in itself like this sort of stuff. Um, going back to our model and the people who have a seat at the table or the areas and topics that we want to do by just look at it, assess it, think about what impact, what use does it have, does it relate to our strategic business objectives and do we think it has a place in our roadmap? There are really important discussions to have to really assess um, whether something is going to add value to your company and whether can it be controlled and turned off or is it just going to be out there and what should we do about that? So hopefully that has helped you understand, um, I guess, how these things aren't just siloed things we look at from an adoption roadmap governance. Um, training, all those kind of things, that it's actually all combined together. Um, and so with that, um, we're actually uh, uh, making available some content soon around actually establishing a centre of excellence. Um, and so we have this lovely new website that's up there. Um, click on that. Other than that, you've got our contact details, so please feel free to reach out. And we've actually left a few moments for some questions. Anyone want to raise their hand or just check the chat, anything, type of question in chat if you are interested. Um, so essentially our session today, we just wanted to get people to take a moment to think about what are you doing in your organisation and what's possible. You know, it doesn't take, as we've said, a massive amount of time. With a bit of thought, you can start some discussions that can help manage your platform ongoing with no surprises um, and with essentially finding it to be great value to the organisation. I'm just rambling while we look for questions. Because I stuffed up the slide. And unfortunately, <laughs> I actually don't have access to the chat in this window because, as I mentioned, Teams have a, had a lovely little fit with me beforehand. So I'm going to have to ask one of our lovely moderators um, if they can read out any chat questions or unmute Oh, them. and actually people can't unmute themselves either. So that was, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, feel free to unmute and ask a question. Or no, you can't. Um, because they're using yep. great, great use case. Yes. Yes, thank, thank you, uh, Lauren and Megan. Uh, there is a, a question of uh, how is your experience on having several CEOs inside a company? Do, do you have a, an experience of having several CEOs? Uh, I don't see. I don't think it's it's a good idea, but that's the question. Having several CEOs. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it, I, the the, well, the I meaning is more to have a team COE, a power platform COE, a power BI COE, oh. for example. Look, Look, I would see them as, um, so yes, you could have subgroups. So yeah. you don't want, if you're going to have a broad group in a COE, you don't need 20 people to be in one discussion about deeply into, say, Power BI, which is really the finance group. So yes, there could be some sub discussions, but you can't have silos. You need to at some point have them maybe, whether it's quarterly or monthly, you know, in, in, in when we both worked together recently, we would come together every Wednesday afternoon with all the principals across the business and Lorraine would feed us all the updates and we would impact assess. Um, you need to have a central point where you come together. They can go off and talk about how we're going to train or how we want to use it in different departments, but there just needs to be the alignment. Otherwise, um, you know, it's silos and no one's communicating and it doesn't work. And a decision could be harmlessly made around sensitivity labels that affect Power BI. So these people need to be at the same table. Yes, as Megan said, how you have subgroups, uh, but no, they need to be at the same table. Yeah. Any other that questions? Definitely makes sense. Um, no other question in the chat, so thank you very much. Thank you everybody thank you for, having for having us. Having us. Enjoy the Enjoy rest, the of, rest the of the nation.
and reach out to you. If you're coming through Caruanas, I'm going to mute you. I'm sorry. That's something I'll never live down. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone. Reach out if you want to discuss further. Take it to Twitter. Have a great day.